Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. I've been wondering for a while just what is in the minds of German bankers who seem willing to let Europe go into a deep recession and do not seem to be having any flexibility on how they collect their debts. Now joining us to try to unpack all of this is Michael Ash. Michael is a professor of economics, chair of the economics department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thanks very much for joining us, Michael. Michael. Thanks for having me, Paul. So, so, so German banks look at this situation. Uh, they see Greece going into deep recession, Spain, Portugal, uh, even France is starting to teeter in a sense. Uh, what is in the minds of these ban German bankers? Well, I think you've asked the question just the right way, and uh, it's really important that we focus our attention on the German banks. I mean, a, um, a fish rots from the head down, and uh, really, if you want to look at the at the uh, both both the causes of the European problem and what and to have good predictions about what's going to happen next, it's essential to think about what's going on in the German banking system. This is really the birthplace of the crisis. So, um, so asking what next from them is a is a really valuable uh, is, a, is a really valuable question. Um, you asked how can they how can they let things slide this far? Well, to be honest, I'm shocked at how far they have let things uh, how far they've let things go. I think at this point, an ideology has taken hold that hey, we've been paying the bills for uh, southern uh, for southern Europe for so long. We're going to stop. That ideology is completely backwards. I can explain why if uh, if you're interested. Yeah, sure. Go yeah, go ahead. Explain. So, well, the ideology is we've been writing the, we the Germans have been writing the checks for these uh, profligate uh, Southern Europeans. And in fact, it's almost the opposite situation. In fact, it's Southern Europeans who have been uh, buying the German goods that have kept the German economy afloat until now. So I think you've got to have a collision coming between this growing uh, Northern European ideology that they've been paying the bills and the fact that uh, much of their reasonably good times of uh, b before the uh, before the crisis were made possible by the uh, earning and spending of, of southern Europeans. I mean, you really have a circular flow economy in Europe, and it's been very badly disrupted. Um, in the, it's been very badly disrupted in the South, and I think that uh, you know, it's going to be some unpleasant consequences as they spread from from the south to uh, up, up, up through uh, France and Germany. So German German banks are essentially undermining, weakening, destroying their own best markets. And most of German exports have been going to these uh, per, quote unquote peripheral countries of Europe. So you know, what is this a strategy about? I mean, I mean, whether it's a strategy or not, what they're going to end up with is much lower wages in all these countries. They're going to try to unravel, and probably will in, in Greece and Spain at least, and Portugal, unravel much of the social safety net, and Italy, I should say, as well. Uh, so they're going to have this big pool of skilled, cheap labor who can't buy as much product. So what's the, what is the objective here? To better compete in, in the developing world, in Asia and China and India, Brazil and such? I think strategy is overstating what we're seeing from the German banks. I think it helps to, if you think about uh, the German banks as kind of a four-faced uh, four statue or four-faced uh, monster, that, that there isn't, no, nobody is at the wheel. And, that, and so it's a mistake to think somebody old and sensible is in charge. There's really nobody in charge at the German banks. There's this kind of fragment, fragments of several systems. So, you know, there's this one German banker who's incredibly inflationophobic. We're told, oh, the memory, the memory of the Weimar inflation, you know, um, uh, eight, nine, 90 years ago at this point, haunts this banker so much, couldn't possibly imagine an expansionary monetary policy. So that's one of the faces of the German banker. And this guy is dead set against, um, against any sort of expansionary activity. Might cause inflation. Very, very scary. Then you've got this other guy who seems nothing like his very conservative uh, anti-inflationary counterpart. He's the gambler who went down to the uh, went went down to the uh, Spanish Riviera looking for some action and just loved rolling the dice and was willing to take these very large gambles um, on uh, Southern European real estate, on you know co coastal real estate in Spain uh, to float float the Greek uh, Greek sovereign debt because it seemed really profitable. So this is this is the kind of let the good times roll. German and you could, add, you could add to that. You could add to that their plays in the American real estate market, and not just subprime mortgage. I mean, I think Deutsche Bank now owns one of the biggest casinos in Las Vegas. 
Yeah, so so right. So it wasn't it wasn't just playing their own real estate market. Uh, I mean, I think they picked up the lesson. I think you can. There's kind of a lesson here that bad banking drives out good. That the, this German banker, the, the high roller, uh, looked across the Atlantic, saw his American cousin, uh, his cowboy cousin, making out making out like a bandit. So he said, "I want to take some of those big bets too," and then did on Southern European real estate, Greek sovereign debt, but also buying uh, CDSs, credit default swaps, and other um, and other exotic. Uh, exotic derivatives from, straight from the U.S. market. So that high roller was really a newcomer to German banking. The, uh, the inflation of FOB um, and uh, the kind of um, uh, really wrecked, very careful German banker were sort of one wing of German banking. Then we got this high, these, these high rollers. Their combination, the high rollers brought on the immediate crisis, and their combination has led to the you know, stern, nasty bill collector German banker who says, ah, the bill must be paid, um, and is really insisting that uh, th- that the bills be paid, even if that collection effort is going to um, is going to you know, ultimately drive the German economy into the ground, and has already done a very uh, has done very serious damage to the uh, Portuguese, Spanish, Greek, and Irish economies, and really, I think you know, Italy is kind of te- teetering on the brink. So you've got these. Uh, we got these three. Let me tell you about the um, the, the last the, the, the last German banker, the one who's been kind of shoved into the corner, who is actually the first one I I learned about, and and and, and is a fairly likable uh, fellow. That's the um, the benevolent social planner. That's the German banker from the 60s and 70s who owned a lot of stock in German companies and was therefore willing to make have plan long-term plans for the future. Wasn't too averse to talking to labor, would invite labor to the table, would even invite labor to be on the board of directors. So, um, so that was kind of the, 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 the good face. So you've got these four faces. The good faces have kind of been crammed into the corner, and these other three are sort of staring at each other, not really in full agreement, but kind of paralyzed because they don't, they don't know what to, do, what to do next. I mean, is part of this that they kind of all buy into this Austrian school of economics that there, there needs to be a catharsis, there needs to be a cleansing. Capitalism needs to go through these periods where it gets rid of excess capacities and better capacity and better disciplines the workforce. I, I mean, do they not just believe in that some, you know, capitalism just is resilient and will go through the quote unquote the pain and out the other side will come a vibrant Europe? But, but I don't know what the evidence for that is, but is that what they believe? I don't they know. They've got to believe that, something here. Yeah. I don't know that there's such a Randian, such a Randian fellow at work in the German banks. I mean, I think that you know the the stern bill collector simply has a the bills must be paid. We we uh, we made the loans. Uh, you must pay back the loans. You know, kind of a very you know, sort of the uh, you must pay the rent landlord who uh, who, who who comes to the who comes 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 to the door with you know, the, uh, the evil must the evil drooping mustache. Um, so I, I don't think that that a, a you know the cleansing you know that a, a cleansing dose of capitalism liquidate 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 is really what these bankers have in mind. I think that they've more have hit a number of contradictions and that they, they sort of don't know which of these bankers is boss. They know that the high roller got them into very serious trouble, so they're not willing to start lending. Um, the inflation hawk and the stern bill collector are maybe. Of, of, a, of a piece, that they are unwilling to try anything too expansionary. Um, you, you know, I think it's, nobody is planning enough uh, for this to be a uh, kind of a well-coordinated strike on the European welfare state. I think that the bankers are willing to sweep up a couple of chips along the way if they, if they're, if they fall on the table and they're easy pickings. But I think it's um, sort of too much, too much planning would be involved to say, oh, this was an engineered crisis. No, but whether, whether, whether it's an engineered, engineered crisis or crisis. not, they're certainly taking advantage of the crisis. And I mean, what you're seeing is massive amounts of privatization uh, you know, in Greece and some of these other same countries. You're going to see lower wages, enormous pressure on the social safety net, and years, I don't see how it's anything but years of deep recession and high unemployment. I mean, that much is objective, objective. is it not? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, that, these, are, these are good points, I, and uh, they, they bring to mind a, cu- a couple of thoughts. Uh, the first is that um, capitalists can't live with stagnation either. So taking advantage of the recession, as I said, to sort of pick up a couple of quick quick hits, um, you know, some, 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 some chips that fallen on the table, some free $20 bills on the sidewalk, I can see that well and good. But I really think that the extent to which the bankers have 
the, the bankers have allowed the European situation to really, at this point, spiral out of control is is, is self-destructive. But they can't do anything about it. They they are really it is not in their it is not in their constitution. It's really going to take a new year. I think a, a new political movement, kind of a new political uh, orientation in Europe to do something about this. I think the bankers have kind of hit the end of you know, sort of. Hit, hit the end of their bag of tricks, and they cannot. They simply cannot envision themselves overseeing um, a Keynesian-type expansion. But they also, I don't think, have planned for a fully stagnated, um, a fully stagnated economy. And this has to come. This, ha- this has to come back and bite them in the bum. I mean, how can this not lead eventually to much more serious stagnation in Germany itself? Well, it has to. I mean, as you pointed out, they have uh, they've cut off they've cut off the fuel to their to their main markets. Uh, they are not. I do not think they can realistically expect to make up the sales, even with the uh, burgeoning uh, the, the burgeoning uh, elite in China and in, in number, if, if not not in in percent. So I really think that they have backed themselves into a rough corner. Now, let me uh, make a couple. I want to take a step back, make a couple of other observations. The first is that. It's interesting to think about where the German working class has been during this period. The German working class, on the one hand, has stayed employed. So they don't have the problems of, unemploy- of, of mass unemployment that the Spanish and Portuguese and Greek working class have. On the other hand, the German working class has really taken over the, on the chin in the last generation. They've been have a, an unwilling or a semi-willing participant in the, um, in the, in the German's Euro-based plan. So they've accepted increasingly low wages, and the German wage share has fallen something like 10 percentage points, which is a massive redistribution from labor to capital in, uh, in Germany over the last uh, generation. German working class has been told that's the price of staying employed. So you won't be as rich, you, you, know, you won't have as big a share of the pie, but you at least won't, you'll, you at least won't be in the same boat that the Southern Europeans have, uh, have found themselves in. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens as this promise becomes increasingly untenable. The promise of, well, at least you're employed, even if uh, even if you're not paid as much, that becomes increasingly untenable. It'll be very interesting to see if there's mobilization by the German working class and other other uh, 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 working class, uh, other union labor movements in northern uh, in northern Europe. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Michael. Well, thanks very much for for having me. Thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.